Welcome to the Movement PT Coffee Cast, where we sit down and talk about physical therapy, health, and whatever else comes to mind during our coffee-infused conversations. guys welcome back to the movement pt coffee cast my name's dalton and with me as always is my beautifully bearded friend william william how are we doing today doing pretty good i uh you know i have a fresh batch of coffee grounds so yes. i'm happy about that it's always a good day and it's like a decent hour to drink coffee like we normally been drinking coffee <laughs> at 8 9 p.m at night and we're up till one in the morning it's 3 p.m on a saturday so it's a reasonable hour to drink coffee Yes, exactly. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, we're back at it again with another interview. Uh, we're interviewing a physiotherapist from the UK. Um, he's the sport physio on Twitter and his blog page, Adam Meekins. Adam, how are you doing? I'm very good, chaps. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Look forward to this. I would say I'm joining you in a cup of coffee, but I'm not because it's 8 p.m. here on a Saturday. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, with, a co- I'm with a cold, fresh, crisp beer, mate. And that, that's okay. We don't discriminate. Mm. Any, any drink is good. <laughs> it looks good too. Kind of jealous. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so it's never too early to crack one open. It's never no. too early. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> so uh, why don't you just, I mean, a lot of people probably heard of you, but why don't you just give a little bit of background on, on who you are and let the people know. Okay. So uh, yeah, my name's Adam. I am a physiotherapist. I have been a physio for 15 years now so I graduated in 2003 Uh, I had life before that before physiotherapist as well so I was a strength and conditioning coach Uh, did a degree my first degree in sports science in 1997 and before that I even had a further career as well so physio is my third career but I started my life off in the uh, British army Uh, so I did did a couple of years there after I left school in the army and so say physio is my third career and I've done various things throughout my career as a physio, but I'm now in this role where I am a uh, ESP for the NHS. So I work 50-50 private practice and uh, public sector in the NHS. So I do an ESP role, which is an extended scope practitioner's role mm. uh, for the NHS. And then I work in private practice as a sports therapist and a clinical lead for a private hospital, uh, working as the lead for a team of 15 physios. So that's my that's my role currently. And then, of course, I'm this knobhead online that everybody's heard of that goes around causing upset and angst and frustration and <laughs> uh, pissing people off left, right and centre because I express my views and opinions quite bluntly, quite directly about various different things that I, I get frustrated about, fashion of ours, which I do love. Lots of people question me and say that I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I clearly don't like physio and I do like being a physio. It just fucking frustrated a lot so <laughs> i tend to vent and frustrate my my concerns online and it upsets people and it's created this sort of i don't know online sort of persona i guess people think it's a persona but it's not it's just the way i am i just got this very blunt and direct approach that does tend to piss people off left right and center <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're saying a lot of things that people think that they just don't say because they're worried that it's going to rub people the wrong way I, that doesn't. Uh, again, I hear that people say that a lot. People are like, oh, you're saying I think this all the time, and I say, well, fucking say it then, mm-hmm. you know? Because I think the more of us that do say it, the quicker things will change. Yeah. You know, I think they say a lot of people are frustrated with the issues that are going on in our profession, and and definitely want to make it a better thing. And 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 unless things change, unless we get the sort of ball rolling, I think it is going to change, or it is going to change very, very slowly. So I, I am big in saying to people when they say it to me, I'll say, well, well, just say it. You know, if you if you feel the same way and you you think the same, say it, say it loud, say it proud. Have have some conviction. If it pisses people off, don't worry about it. You know, every, in, if people get pissed off when you express any opinion about anything nowadays. So that's just part and parcel of life. Just just stand up and say what you want to say don't be don't be shy don't be afraid to say things yeah i think it's it's interesting i think people think because like you you obviously say it the way that the two you are people feel like the only way that they can say something would be they don't have to be like you they don't have to be blunt they don't have to to take your approach they can stand up and have a voice in their own way and i think people don't see that they see one perspective and they're like well i don't want to be like that like he's being a dick but if you have an opinion, doesn't doesn't mean you have to say it in that way. You can say it in a way that 
you think is a good way to get it across to other people. It's better than not saying anything at all. Absolutely. No, I'll put my hands up and be the first to admit that I can be a dick on a regular <laughs> occurrence. So I'm, I'm quite well aware of that. And uh, as I say, not proud of it, I suppose, but it just sometimes comes across that way and that I can be. But yeah, you, you don't have to do the Meekins method. You don't have to do it my way. You can do it your way. Just, you know, you've got a concern, you've got a frustration, you think something's not right. Just say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people too, they don't look deep enough into what you're saying. They, they see on a surface level some of the things that, that you say, and then they automatically get turned away from it. But if they actually dive deep into what you're, you're trying to get across, like you're, it's really, really good stuff. And I think people are missing out on that. Yeah, and again, I think that's probably, again, 50-50 my fault, 50-50 their fault, because I, I, I do sometimes, I think, not get out to a bigger audience because those barriers do go up straight away as soon as they do hear my uh, my approach, my methods, my language. And, and a lot of people have said to me, you know, if you just toned it down a bit, Adam, if you just changed your style and your approach, you'd reach such a bigger audience and you'd probably make a bigger impression. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, probably. I understand that. I get that. But I'm not going to start mm-hmm. smoothing off the edges that I have had for the last 44 years of my life. You know, I'm, I'm not going to start yeah. changing or pandering to people just, just yeah. because it amuses them. I'm, I am who I am. And if you don't like it, tough fucking shit. <laughs> not everybody has to like you right but I, I, I think it's i couldn't think of anything worse if everybody liked me i'd be <laughs> fucking pulling my hair out yeah exactly let's uh let's kind of dive into your approach i know you you kind of say it's a simpler approach or more of a, a minimal approach can you kind of elaborate on that um and how you've kind of developed that over time in your career yeah it's again i'll I'll be open and honest here and say that this is something that's happened slowly and gradually it's not just mm. something that i've always done done as a physiotherapist but I'd probably say quite early on in the career I I was quite keen and interested in all the modalities and and the magic techniques that I I was taught and led to believe were the answers in helping people so I I did uh, I went on all the courses I went on the postgraduate certifications I jumped through the hoops of assessment being modulated to gain these extra initials after my name so I've done it all I've done the manipulation courses I've done the manual therapy myofascial releases and all these sort of things, dry needling, acupuncture, all the taping courses you can name of, all the electrotherapy courses you name of. Um, and I've just realized that as as I started to do more and more of them, they, they were letting me down sooner, quicker, easier. I just started to realize that the magic answers aren't there. They're not in these things. So I, I started to look elsewhere. And again, I went back to my background roots as a strength and conditioning coach. And I've always had it in the background. I've always been using mm-hmm. it quite strongly as, as my main treatment approach. And I've just realized... I don't really need that much extra above and beyond what I can do with exercise and education. And so those are the foundations of my treatment. Now I I have gone through this process where I've completely abandoned all the adjuncts. So I, I, I don't mobilize. I don't manip. I don't massage. I don't tape. I don't needle any patients anymore. And that doesn't mean I don't touch people as well. Cause that's the often yeah. You know, straw man that's thrown at me all the time yeah. is because you don't um, do manual therapy, therefore you're not touching patients. And that's bullshit. I, I examine my patients thoroughly using touch because that means a shitload to patients. Yeah. And I'm, I'm keen on promoting that, you know, that you, you're in a position of uh, quite profound responsibility as a physiotherapist. You, you've, get, you've got the right to touch a patient and examine with our patient. And, and I think it means, and it does, I don't think it means it. I know it means a lot to patients to spend the time examining an area that's concerning them, that's got pain, that they are frustrated or worried about, or that they think is slightly squiffy or that they think is something, you know, sticking out where it's not supposed to be. I use palpation a lot with every patient I see, but most of the time it, it's for reassurance purposes. It's telling them 99% of the time, there's nothing there for you to worry about. That's perfectly normal. But unless you actually take the time to actually palpate and touch and physically examine it, they won't believe you that it's all right and normal. So I am, I'm a big believer of trying to promote that and say, although I have banned manual therapy and I don't rub and I don't massage and I don't click and I don't poke and I don't press, I palpate. Uh, but again, I know the reliability of palpation is very poor clinically as well, but I do it for reassurance purposes. Yeah. You do it to show them that you're doing a thorough assessment and that you're checking them out. It's like, obviously, if you just kind of stare at them and you're like, uh, you're fine, you're not really 
showing that you're paying a lot of attention to them. Absolutely. So like, pa- yeah. Patients, yeah. Pa- patients want reassurance that, you know, that somebody yeah. has spent the time to properly listen to their problems and then take the time to examine them. And unfortunately, again, you know, our medical colleagues aren't the best at this. You know, they're rushed with time. They don't have the time in their assessments to do things as thoroughly as we could do. So we are in this position of responsibility where we do have a bit longer to thoroughly listen to the patients better, take that better history and do that thorough examination. Um, and, and again, I just see it it is an important part of of building up that therapeutic alliance with your patient as well, which is key. Yeah. I think uh, I mean, we were talking about this the other day. I think people, I think as physios, we take that for granted sometimes that, that a lot of time that we actually have um, to build that therapeutic alliance and actually start to get them to know them on a more personal level because they don't get that in other areas of the healthcare system. And I think we're, we're so focused on all these different things that we can do like all like what you just kind of went through, like the modalities and what approach we're going to use. And we're, we're losing focus on the, the idea that we actually get to spend half an hour, 45 minutes with this person. Um, and, and if we lose that, it, it's not going to be good for our profession. No, absolutely not. And, and again, that is a, sometimes it's a, it's a misrepresentation of my argument of moving away from manual therapy is that we'll lose the ability to palpate and touch patients. And that that's not an argument at all. And that's not what I'm saying. It's just that it's that it's the therapeutic benefits of massage and manipulations are, are limited. I'm not going to say they do nothing because they do do something. There's research out there to show that they, they can modulate pain, but it's very short lasting. It's very unreliable as to who it works on and who it doesn't work on. Um, so the therapeutic role of m- manual therapy and palpation is is the bit that I've abandoned. But the examination and the actual uh, use of it to help me build my clinical picture and reassure patients is is part and parcel of my everyday day in yeah. day out job. I feel like there's a lot that you've covered in the last uh, few minutes. I feel like uh, one thing I really want to talk about is the idea we kind of labeled it as a simple approach, right? It's exercise and education, but having some experience, we know that that can actually be really challenging. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's lots of misconceptions around the simple approach. And one of them is that it's easy. Yeah. You know, the belief, the belief, oh, you know, oh, well, if all you do, Adam, is just talk to your patients and give them a few exercises, what do you do with the other 29 minutes of your session? Uh, and that's the biggest misrepresentation of a simplified approach, because if anything, it's the exact fucking opposite. Yeah. Doing things simply really well, really thoroughly is probably the hardest bit of the job. Um, because a lot of the patients come to see you with expectations that they need all these complicated assessments and procedures and interventions. And then actually you have to try and reframe that and turn that around to try and get patients to accept that 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 stuff is not the stuff they need to worry about they have to take ownership and look and focus on you know something as simple as one thing that they can't do and they need to focus on that one thing they can't do and expose themselves to that which they're probably shit scared of doing which they've probably been backing away from doing which they're terrified of doing and rather than just you know expecting to have a massage or a bit of tape or something put on them to make it temporarily feel better you now have got to turn around and say to them i actually want you to do the one thing you don't want to do i want you to work that arm and move it into the positions that hurt a bit and you've got to try and reassure and educate and motivate a patient to do that Uh, and that ain't simple that that is fucking far from simple it it sounds simple on paper and looks simple on paper but it isn't it is something to say that's a lot harder to do the easy option would be to just do whatever the patient wants the easy option would be to do the short-term magic treatment tricks and the patient thinks you're a fucking genius for five, <laughs> 10 minutes because their pain's gone down. Yeah. That's the easy job. Just, you know, doing whatever patients expect and want will work mm-hmm. to a certain degree, but that that's not what we should be doing as healthcare professionals. I, I often say this and I get myself in a lot of trouble with, I say it, but I'm going to say it again, you know, <laughs> physiotherapists, in fact, all healthcare clinicians are not the prostitutes of healthcare. You know, we are not just taking patients yeah. money, to do whatever they want that, that's what prostitutes do <laughs> you know we, we are here to you know be paid to give consultation advice and guidance that sometimes patients don't want to do or don't want to expect 
uh, or don't expect. So we, we have to be bold and brave and comforting and compassionate and reassuring in telling patients, no, nope, that's not what's going to happen today. This is what happened needs to happen instead. Yeah. You have to be. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear like a little bit about how like um, the people that come and see you respond to that when you, when you like kind of take, like they're asking you for one thing and then you're trying to, you, you give them something else or you say, no, we're not doing that. Like, how has that been? Cause like from a student perspective, we haven't had that much experience from it. So, so to hear that would be, would be interesting to me. It, it's bloody hard. Let's put it like that. And the, the key way that you're going to, succeed in this approach is to get patients to trust you and like you so the key aspect of it is the therapeutic alliance you've yeah. got to nail that you've got to get that down to point pretty quickly pretty sharpish because as soon as you get that patient to trust you and 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 respect you and listen to you then they're more likely to do the things that you're going to ask them to do so therapeutic alliance and rapport building these are the things that are commonly called soft skills in our profession. I fucking hate that term because they're so not soft skills. Yeah. They're anything but. So it, it's getting the patient to trust and like you is the key factor to get them to do the things that they don't want to do or to change their mind about advice that they've been given from elsewhere, which is normally shitty advice. So again, trying to get a patient who's got an expectation to go for, you know, they're going to need subacromial decompression for their shoulder pain. And they've seen a surgeon and the surgeon says, yeah, yeah, we need to shave this bony spur off and everything. And you know, at the back of your head, that's a load of bullshit. That's a crap operation. Mm -hmm. But trying to turn that mindset around for a patient who's seen a surgeon in a swanky office, you know, with a nice suit on, with an assistant, with a very good reputation behind him. Uh, and he said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll do this operation because that, that's what's needed. But just go and try a bit of physiotherapy first because, you know, he, he's starting to realize that perhaps, you know, just give it a try, see if it works. But, you know, I'm sure I'll probably see you in six to 12 weeks time anyway. So this patient's in the mindset, comes to see you as a physio. And they said, well, I've seen this surgeon. I've got this bony spur. He, he tells me I need to shave, shave it off. And I'm coming to see this physiotherapist. And now you, you've got to try and convince them that actually this operation isn't in their best interest. We've got research that shows it's nothing more than a placebo, that it isn't the thing that's going to make them feel better because of the way they think it's going to make them feel better. There's risks involved with it as well, albeit small, but there's still risks. You've got to try and get that patient to trust you when you're wearing a polo shirt and a crack suit in a grotty <laughs> little office, as opposed to, as opposed to a surgeon with a fancy suit, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. again, that, that isn't easy to change that mindset so again this is where the rapport building skills come in that's where it, the communication factor is is so key if you can start to get that patient to actually trust and and actually think oh this person actually knows i think a bit more than that bloody surgeon that i'm, I'm going to start actually listening to this guy or girl now yeah. that that's the key aspect to that that this approach yeah, and people and people say it's it is hard but the thing is is we don't get we don't get brought up to take that approach. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're in school right now and we, we don't focus that much on those things. Like it's, again, it's talked about on the surface level because it's starting to become brought up more and more of how important it is, but in actually getting down into like the nitty gritty of being able to, to deal with those situations, like we don't get exposed to them. And then you get thrown into that in, in the real, in the real world. And you, you don't really know what, what to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you're not prepared for it. So I feel like a lot of people just resort back to what we learned, like, you know, tens ultrasound and, and ice because that's all yeah. we really have to fall back on. But then you get yeah. these, like, crazy expectations thrown at you sometimes. Like uh, I've had experiences where patients literally think that cutting their arm off would be the best approach to get rid of their pain. Like just like, just get rid of it, just take it away. And then you're throwing them into a situation where they're dependent on those passive modalities and you can mm -hmm. see it kind of happening, right? Like that, that. that's that's the easy approach doing that is the they getting getting those treatments where you don't actually have to communicate or talk with a patient that, that's why i think a lot of people do them because it, yeah. it just gives them an out it gives them an option where they don't actually have to approach these difficult subjects with a patient they they just sort of shy away from it because mm -hmm. they're either unprepared or they just don't want to do it yeah, so they have to sort of use these shitty treatments where as you say they get they do they, they appear to be doing something for a short period of time and they just don't have to engage with the patient and discuss the yeah. long-term uh picture the bigger picture so it might be difficult you know like they might cry they might break down you know yeah. when you're when you're yeah. approaching some yeah. of the things and 
you you have to like like you kind of talked about you have to have some balls when it comes to that you know and be confident and prepared that you can you can chip away at some of these things you know even if it's not yeah. going to happen in the day and i do think as i say unfortunately that the physiotherapy training doesn't do a good job at, at training uh uh, physios uh, to do that. I mean, I was quite fortunate. I, I entered into physiotherapy world with a bit of life experience with other things, you know, so I, I, I dealt with people in some pretty extreme circumstances in my first job and in my second job, I had to interact with, with clients on a customer service basis as well. Mm. And, and, and I see again, fresh physio grads coming in without that much life experience and not being taught how to engage and communicate with people that they struggle flounder and then that's where i do see them being drawn to these modalities because as i said it gives them an option to to not actually have to broach the difficult aspect which is your communication skills which is being able to cope with these extreme cases like you explained when a patient yeah. breaks down and cries on you know like Whoa, what do i do i know i'll stick some fucking needles in yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> again i i blame i blame the training that the, the physiotherapy training has i mean it was shocking when i did it 15 years ago it just poorly equips physios for the real world practicalities of what's out there with people with pain it just doesn't arm them of how to deal with these things uh physically physically and psychologically as well so again i just think it's it's something that needs to change at an undergraduate level so again and the other thing i try to say to physio students is 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 just try and go and get some background experience and life experience of dealing in a customer service industry you know even if that is just working behind a counter somewhere just start talking to people have to be in healthcare but just start mm. talking to people in in sometimes you know when people are frustrated and anxious and pissed off so it can be any customer service sort of job just just deal with it just start to learn how to engage with people because that will help you as a physiotherapist yeah for sure you're we're interacting with people every day and and then obviously some people have that some people have that innate skill of being able to read someone or have good emotional intelligence and people, I think people use that as a cop out as saying like, oh, you know, that's just something that you're given. Yeah, I think it's something that, that you can have, but you can also train yourself to be aware Absolutely. of those things, to pay attention to those things. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's, there's resources out there that can help you understand how to ask certain questions, you know, and like, I think those are a lot of things that we can actually have implemented into our education that aren't being implemented that can actually help us. And, and I feel like that's something where the education system needs to go to help prepare, better prepare the physio physiotherapists that are coming out of school. Absolutely. Get rid of the electrotherapy module and insert a motivational interviewing module in there. It's yeah. There yeah. Be so much more valuable. Mm -hmm. You kind of touched on it. Uh, you're talking about like, we've actually talked about this idea in our, we're kind of lucky. We have a pretty sweet pain course actually here. Um, and uh, we've talked about the idea of where does the line get drawn between where we're a psychologist and we're a physical therapist. I know you've written a blog about this, so I just kind of yeah. wanted to hear some of your thoughts on uh, what that line kind of is. And yeah. Well, that. well, for me, yeah, for me, it, it comes when pain isn't having an impact on any physical activity or, or lifestyle yeah. task. So when, when that pain's not impacting on their ability to do their job, ability to live their life or do anything along those lines, uh, then, then I think the physiotherapist's job is over and then it's down to the psychologist there. So that, that's my line in the sand because, again, I'm a, but I, I don't think I've ever come across it because pain affects you know, not only the, the mind and, and stuff, but I've, I've never come across somebody. I, know that I had this discussion on Twitter or probably about a year ago with somebody who said that they'd see it a lot. And I'm like, really? I've never come across anybody who's in pain who hasn't got some issue with an activity or a task or a movement. Mm, I've, yeah. I've never come across it clinically, but they, they reckon they have. They said they, I was discussing it with, said they reckon they saw a lot of people who were functioning fine, were able to do their job, were able to carry on exercising, do all their tasks, but they just still had pain. And that's why they were seeing them. And I was like, that's not a physio's job. You know, if they're exercising three times a week, yeah. if they're doing their job and they're able to function, then what, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. What are you well, I'm treating them for their, I'm treating them for their pain. I'm like, you're not a pain therapist. You're a physiotherapist who knows how to deal with pain. Yeah. So that, that's my, that's my line in the sand there really. Yeah. It still opens up uh, windows for us to use strategies that 
maybe are borrowed from other disciplines like cognitive behavioral therapy type stuff or motivational interviewing. It's, it doesn't mean we're a psychologist, right? It just the inherent like nature of pain that is largely psychologically driven. Um, Mm -hmm. probably not a hundred percent. Right. And in that many cases, like you kind of mentioned, um, but it's definitely a a massive factor. Well, uh, the clues in our title of our name, you know, we're physical therapists, physiotherapists. Mm -hmm. So it involves the physical function of movement and activities and tasks. That's, that's what we're here to help people with. Pain gets in the way of that. Therefore we need to know what pain is. Exactly. Pain also gets in the way of shit loads of other things that aren't physical. I'm not saying it doesn't. And and our treat may help improve those other things, you know, not only improve their physical abilities, but it helps improve their other things because their yeah. pain reduces, hopefully. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we are here to help everybody with their pain problems. You know, we're not here to help them with their 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 lifestyle issues and not help we're here to counsel them with their shitty partners that they've got a crappy relationship with that's causing a lot of stress and anxiety which is also probably a driver for their pain we're not here for that that that's down to other professional right uh, bodies that are better equipped with that sort of stuff not us yeah yeah i think the important part is being aware of that though i think we don't that that can be influencing the 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 pain that they're experiencing which can be influencing their function that we can have an impact on i think a lot of times we, we, even in school, like the education around pain, we don't, we're just starting to get better, like understanding or teaching us about those psychological factors that can drive it. But I feel like a lot of times we just dis- sometimes dismiss those things and think it's solely just something that might is biomechanically driven, which isn't necessarily true. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good point. You know, we, we do have to recognize the other stresses that are driving mm-hmm. pain. It's never as simple. It's, it is never as simple as tissue based it's as yeah. simple as biomechanical base. doesn't mean, again, that other straw man that we throw out the biomechanics, you know, people that understand pain or they don't worry about the buyer and they'll fucking hate that. Yeah. You know, it's not what we're saying at all. It's just that we know it's never about the tissues in isolation. You know, the tissues can be a massive driver in certain conditions, you know, that's, that's for sure. And then the biomechanics and the physiology and all that sort of stuff that you've learned comes into play. But then there's other cases where we see the, the biomechanics and the physiology and the tissue based uh, issues are minimal. But then there's these other drivers, these psychosocial drivers as well, mm-hmm. some of which we can probably address a little bit, but we're not equipped to deal with it but mm-hmm. you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt sometimes just to discuss with a patient how their job is you know and the stress they may be getting from their boss and maybe yeah. discuss a little, little bit you know, briefly about you know what are they doing about it do they need some support because we've got colleagues we can refer to and i do that often you know i get mm-hmm. patients telling me they're they're they don't think they were depressed or or uh, anxious or anything along those lines but when you start to ask a few questions it starts to come out and then it all starts to build and build and you're like right they've got a really shitty job they've got this boss that's on them all the time that's giving them our time and this is what i think is driving the part of their yeah. back pain so i say to them you know i need to go and speak to somebody about how to cope and deal with this the other factors that are mm-hmm. kicking up and that's what we're there for to help and refer on if needs be to other people and other professions yeah i think like some of that don that i've really talked about uh in the last few months is the idea of sometimes those social factors is as simple as giving them permission or encouraging them to just return to some of the things that they're doing previously. It's like hardly any therapy. It's just kind of having a discussion about like, what is it that you want to do? Um, Do you want to go gardening with your friends or um, do you want to go to whatever, whatever it is that that person does. And that's kind of like your social intervention, but really it's not like anything that fancy. It's just no, it's, spending the time. Yeah, again, listening to a patient, as you say, and asking the right questions. I mean, you've just asked yeah. a couple of great questions there, and that's that's not often done in, in an interview. You know, you don't actually – a lot of people don't just simply ask, you know, what is the one thing you want to get back going again? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and once you've got that and you say, well, what's stopping you? Well, then a lot of them will turn around and say, well, I don't know. Is it safe? or not when you do your assessment and you take your history and you can give them the all clear and say yeah it's safe to carry on so yeah safe that's what patients want a lot of the time they just want the green light to say this pain is there is it going to cause me any detriment if i carry on and do things that are hurting and a lot of the time patients just want to hear no it's fine it's safe if there's nothing there for you to worry about right 
Yeah, it kind of comes along with another, I know you're a big fan of like being like a movement optimist and that like everyone kind of has variation. I think you just recently posted something about that on your Instagram where like you're talking about how like everyone's handwriting is, there's so much variation in that, like there's so much variation in movement, but yet we're so focused on like that there's this only one way to move. And, I, and that's something that I've really seen um, over the course of like my placements and stuff where people are very quick to like shut things down because they don't look the look normal type thing. And I, and I, I, you can see people get kind of like the the life sucked out of their eyes when you're like telling them, Oh, you can't do that. Or you can't do this. And mm. yeah, you see that a lot. You know, a lot of patients go to see a physiotherapist with one or two problems and they leave with about six <laughs> or seven of them afterwards because they've just been added to, you know, not only have they told they've got pain in their shoulder. Now they've got a winging scapula and a twisted <laughs> sublux pelvis and a sc- spine as well which they have no fucking idea about and and it's probably got nothing to cause any issues or any relation to their pain anyway but yeah you see physios just love to go and sort of find problems and and you know explain to patients in ways that they don't understand and then so-called fix them because it just makes them feel special but again i think i don't blame physios a lot of physios for that just because it's what they're taught to believe it's what they're taught to do i was i was taught to find these things and again I've gone through this process of just through time and understanding and, and reading and reading and reading and realizing it's not this simple. You know, it is a case that you know, movement variability and these so-called dysfunctions that we're taught to look for might not actually be dysfunctions. They're just normal adaptations or just yeah. normal skeletal morphologies mm-hmm. that we're seeing. And that's not to say that they're bad, yeah. um, but that's, but then again, we don't want to let the pendulum shift too far. You know, as much as I am a movement option as much as i am keen about different movement variations and variabilities it can go too far it can go the other way where people just don't give a shit about biomechanics and don't think that things need to be done in certain particular ways that are more efficient or easier or comfortable to do so uh, it's finding that middle ground which i can't believe i'm saying because (laughs) (laughs) This is great. I have this reputation for being for being a bit too one sided, but no. I, again, when it comes to movement variation, I'm all for it. I am like I did with that, that uh, Instagram post where I said, you know, handwriting is going to be different. People's squat patterns are going to be different. People's uh, scapula thoracic movements are going to be different as well. You know, we got to accept that. But you know, there's still times when I see somebody moving it, it makes me want to vomit, and I go, that's just fucking ugly. Yeah. We've got to sort that out. That's just yeah. all over the place. That's mm-hmm. just, you know, you've just got absolutely no coordination. You've got absolutely no body sense. You are discombobulated. You know, you, you, what I call a movement moron. You know, you've gone from one extreme <laughs> to the other. I don't, I don't call them movement morons, not to their faces anyway. <laughs> but you just see people, you know, you, yeah. you just ask them to do a simple basic right. task and you're going, they, yeah, they're just just all over the place. So you go. There are times when I say, "Fuck, you know, that's this this yet this under wraps a little bit." But yeah. I am not as strict as I once was. You know, I don't go around telling people they have to keep their knees in alignment when they're squatting. They have to keep them over their second toes and all that sort of shit. But I do intervene with certain things. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, like uh, it's kind of like I, I've been thinking a lot about this and it, like being doing some reading on my own, like reading your blogs, reading Greg Lehman's blogs, like Nick Hanna, he's a, he's from Canada. He's a big guy that we follow. And just like, just showing us that there's more to it than just like the biomechanic side of things. Like not that that's not important, but it honestly gave me some relief when I started realizing that I didn't have to identify all these little dysfunctions and like when my prof is asking like oh do you see that wing or did you see that like degree move and like that like trying to when I'm learning this in school I'm just like holy crap like how am I going to be able to go I don't see anything or I don't feel this and like when I started yeah. realizing that there's more to it and that you have the opportunity to facilitate and impact people in different ways it honestly gave me some relief I'm like okay, I feel like this is more manageable now for me. It might be a little more difficult in terms of like what we were saying before. You have to take the time to create that relationship and all, and all that stuff, but it's just way more, way more of a relief. I don't know though, Dalton. Absolutely. You got a little bit of a kyphosis going on yeah, here. <laughs> you might have pain later on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good point. We do, we we do need to take the pressure off physiotherapists in in identifying these so-called dysfunctions, mm-hmm. these movement uh, imperfections, because it uh, say the, the, the research just tells us these fine, detailed, minimal sort of things yeah. are probably not 
impact in any way, shape, or form. But the, but the but ugly stuff probably is. So right. there are there are some there are some exceptions. You know, I, I I look at movement, and when something makes me want to vomit, I get involved in that. I try to coach that. I try to mm-hmm. assist that. I try to I try to smooth off the edges of something that's looking but ugly, and yeah. that's also painful and uncomfortable for somebody as well. So uh, that's the other thing. But yeah, as you said, you know, the slight imbalances or the upward rotations of their fucking pelvises or slightly looking <laughs> scapulars and all that. So I'm like, yeah, that, that, that don't matter. That don't bother. I think it's like maybe just a bit of a change in the way we talk about it. Like, like there's definitely ways to alter loads to be more or less stressful on the body, right? Like just thinking about, uh, let's say like a deadlift, for example, uh, if someone's experiencing back pain, then there may be ways to alter the load so that they can deadlift uh, a little bit more efficiently or something like that. Yeah. Not that Maybe necessarily them- it's bad to move in a certain way. It's more just let's alter the mm-hmm. load, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or just, you know, get them to do it under spinal flexion. <gasps> <laughs> Loaded spinal flexion? Are you fucking crazy? Oh, yeah. I find that so mind-blowing, the whole spinal flexion thing. It's just... Yeah. It can be a little bit frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's just that sort of way that to led to believe, you know, when you're moving yeah. loads, you have to do it, you know, in a certain particular way. And again, I'll give a caveat there that if you're doing it in certain circumstances and you're doing it with loads you probably do have to but yeah. the, the body will self-optimize 99 percent of the time you put a task or a load onto somebody 99 percent of the time uh, the, the the system will self-organize to find the most efficient comfortable strategy to right. move so we just don't want to we just don't want to intervene and fuck that up too much yeah. we want to help and assist a little bit if they can't find it but that very rarely happens in my experience you just see right movement patterns self-optimized depending on the task and the load that you give them. Right. Yeah. Um, so we are the PT coffee cast and we know that you are a fan of coffee. So we have a segment that we call, how do you brew it? So we're interested in knowing how Adam Meekins brews his coffee. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a, not a coffee snob, so I just <laughs> tend to have mine black and that's it. Strong and black. So again, yes. I, I find it, strange i go to different countries and uh, i ask for a, just a simple black coffee and they say is that a flat black or a long black or you know <laughs> just a black I'm, I'm, I'm just like what said, where was it i was australia that was it they wanted to know if i wanted a long black and i was like well, yeah all right i'll have one of those then <laughs> and it was it was just a black coffee that's all i wanted just a simple black coffee but different countries they call them different things yeah so, but yeah. i drink long blacks i'm not gonna lie <laughs> just it's it's not a it's not an espresso i don't like that because that's just that's just teasing you with coffee that is that's just like a little little thimble i don't like an espresso but i like i like my coffee as strong as an espresso but i want it in a proper mug so i could probably have an espresso but it just needs to be by probably half a liter yeah yeah that's why the long black would be good for you then if you don't if you don't want an espresso it's a little shot of it so no i I, I, I like when I was in a, when I was in Australia and I kept asking for black coffee. I went eventually with a long black and I got used to it. But yeah, it's fine. Just a strong black coffee for me will do. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Um, we we we're going back to another one of the blogs you wrote, um, talking about the top ten things that make a great physio. Um, uh-huh. So just want to maybe talk about some of those things, like have a nice little positive note. Like what are some of the things that you think that makes like a great physio? I'm going to have to try and remember that blog post now. I can't remember <laughs> it was so long ago. Um, I, I think, you know, again, it, it's personal skills. That's what makes a good physiotherapist. It's just being, it's just being a confident, but not arrogant person. It's in a, uh, somebody that works hard, that is diligent, you know, that is willing to put the, the time and the effort in to, to learn and perfect their, their understanding of this weird complex thing that we have to deal with, which is a human, which mm-hmm. involves psychology, yeah. sociology, physiology. So uh, I think that that's the part of it. You have to work hard. You have to be a nice person. You have to have good communication skills. You have to have a bit of humility, but you know, people will say that's rich coming from me probably. Um, 
and 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 I think you just gotta you got you gotta have a certain you know sunny disposition because this job can get you down. This job can drain the life out of you. So you you have to be able to have some coping strategies to be able to deal with that. Uh, and I do find that the most successful best therapists that I've met in my career and over the years are the funniest people that I want to be around with and have a drink with. And <laughs> I find that those are the ones that, that tend to work best best with people. What are, what are some of the coping strategies you use? Like it just meeting up with those people and having those conversations or shit loads of whiskey. <laughs> 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 that's a very good effective coping strategy there you go that 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 and lifting big heavy fucking weights up at the end of the day as well that gets a lot of stress and and anxiety out so no i, I think i think exercise is a, is a key coping strategy for me again yeah. just to to again release the the stresses the anxieties and the frustrations of the day so I always tell people, you know, find something you enjoy doing. And happily for me, it tends to be picking heavy stuff up and putting it down again. But, you know, doing that is is definitely a coping strategy. And just having a good social support network around you. So, again, mm. having like-minded individuals that you can connect with and talk to and discuss problem cases with and frustrating mm. cases with and the successes as well because you've got, you got to pat yourself on the back and applaud yourself when you get those successes because that's important mm-hmm. to do. Um, so yeah, just having a good network of, you know, therapists and family and friends around you that you can, you can share those things with. Awesome. Like yeah. I think Dalton wanted to ask you about your, uh, podcast that you have yourself. Yeah, I know we're, uh, <laughs> we're just another fucking physio podcast, but we're glad that you, uh, consider coming on it. Uh, how was that? Why did, how did that get started for you? What's kind of the motivation behind you starting the podcast and have you learned anything from, from doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, I started it as as just a piss take. Uh, that's how I started it. I had no intention of doing it for, for this long uh, at all. It was just something I was thought I'd do one or two little piss take interviews, and then it would just fade away. But it started to actually gain some traction. So I was like, all right, okay, I'll see how this goes. And so I started interviewing a few more people, and yeah, I did it. It was quite enjoyable just discussing and talking to people like we are now, you know. Yeah learning from each other from people but i just found it an arse sake that was the other problem is trying to sort of find the time in my day and scheduling appointments and finding people that i actually wanted to talk to or who wanted to talk to me because that was the other thing you know there are a lot of people just like no fucking way am i talking to you on <laughs> that 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 became a bit of a barrier so I, I sort of put it on a hiatus for a little while but then uh, my mate eric said let's get this going again let's get it started so me and eric uh, just do it now as sort of by you guys you know the two of us just chewing the shit for a half an hour about various yeah. different yeah yeah it's a great way it's honestly a great way to connect with people that's something that we've noticed is yeah. just reach out to people like it's crazy that we're having this conversation with you if you're across the world you know it's kind of it's cool i think it's a yeah. good way to, to bring people Absolutely. together and talk about and, and i think it's a great way to learn rather than just having to read journal articles as well you know you can listen to yeah. podcasts you know in your car and your journey to work you know and you yeah. just you can you can get some real great tips you know, some of the best things I think I've learned over the last couple of years have come from podcasts rather than reading research journals. Not to say don't read your fucking research journals, people. Still read your research, <laughs> right? But, you know, yeah. podcasts are a nice way as well to, to get some tips and clinical pearls, for sure. For, for sure. That's a, we know you're obviously a big, a big uh, proponent of the research side of things. What are some, like, from a student perspective, like, we, we get, it's hard because, like, we get bombarded and, like, we don't really – we get taught kind of how to interpret it, but what are some common mistakes that you see people making when they're, when they're reading research and maybe some tangible things that they can start implementing to help them be better at, at interpreting it? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, the, the, the trouble is obviously nowadays, as you know, there's so much research out there trying to stay on top of it is not impossible. So uh, the, the trouble I think is just the sheer volume. It sort of daunts yeah. people. So I, I, I tell them, you know, don't let that daunt you. You just got to accept the fact that there's stuff you're not going to know mm-hmm. and you're not going to be able to read. So, you know, if somebody says to you, have you read this paper? Don't beat yourself up when you turn around and say, oh, no, I haven't, you know, yeah. you know, cause that, that's not unexpected. You know, people turn around to me and say i'm surprised you haven't read that one adam say so, fuck off it's like there's you know just in the shoulders which i try to stay up to date with there's probably eight thousand <laughs> papers a day published there's no way i'm going to be able to read them all right um so i think that's the first thing is just don't let the the, the amount of research daunt you too much 
And the other thing is just stay critical, stay really critical when you're reading the research. I mean, I think the biggest thing I tell people for is, is, is look at the authors and, and look at their, their reasons for doing this research. That's the first question to ask. Why does this person want to know this question? Because you tend to find that there is vested interest in the background a shitload yeah. of time. Yeah. Right. So if you look at especially the, modal- the modality research, you look at the authors of the modality researches, you'll see, you know, when you dig a little bit, that they all do and sell courses or books on said modality. So that's already starting to show you that there is bias there. This mm-hmm. author is doing this research to prove what they already think or what they already know. And that's not the way to do research. Yeah. You know, the way to do research right. is, is to ask a question to try and prove yourself wrong. It's all about false ability, not about, re- uh, not about trying to prove yourself right. So when somebody already has that mindset as an author, you know, you probably can't trust that research very well. That's not to say you can't, but you just have to be a bit more critical and a bit more skeptical if you see that. And then just know your stats well, you know, just learn how to read and interpret statistics better. Uh, and, and again, statistics are important, but it's not just about what they tell you. It's about what they don't tell you in the statistics. That's even more important. Right. The statistics are like, are like bikinis, you know. Bikinis cover up, you know, the really important stuff. And that's exactly what statistics do as well. <laughs> I like that. So it, it, I think, again, you just got to keep in mindset that when somebody does a statistical analysis or plot graph or anything and they show you that something has worked or so they show you an effect, look and say, well, why did they choose that particular method or that particular way of analyzing that data? You know, and then try and think, well, is there another way of analyzing data that, that may give out a different uh, um, outcome? And a lot of the time there is. So you can see, again, a lot of people are very clever with statistics. They can play and turn it around to actually show an effect that you think is there when actually it probably isn't there if you were to look at it in another way. So that's where you've got to say, no, and, and don't get me wrong, I fucking hate statistics. You know, I haven't <laughs> got that sort of brain. I haven't, and, and I'm not the best at it, and that's why I like Eric, because I can just go and ask him. He's got that analytical, he's got that genius-type brain set that can just go and sort of work it out just without thinking about it. For me, I'm sitting there going, no, I can't get this on <laughs> oh, yeah. If I put two, put two over there. That's me. So, <laughs> so, again, as much as I'm saying, you know, understand statistics a lot, I do realize it's not for everybody and I, I really do struggle with it. So if you don't, find somebody who does and ask them the question, say, hey, what's going on here? Is there another way that this can be interpreted? Don't trust p-values. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Who are we going to ask, Dalton? we got to find somebody. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> you can't Eric, ask Dalton. Eric. Eric loves it. He, you know, right. just, okay. just send him an email. He'll, Eric, he'll hate me for saying that. <laughs> Actually, all your listeners, Poor any Eric. statistical questions you've got, just send them to Eric Mira. He's on Twitter <laughs> at Eric Mira. Uh, he's also found online the Science PT. He'll more than happy respond to you within 24 hours. I think he tells me. Perfect. <laughs> any statistical go. questions on any papers, he'll be happy to uh, to oblige and answer those questions for you because he's not Eric, busy at all. Twenty emails from us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh that'd be so funny uh, so i gotta i'm gonna go a little bit I don't, i'm curious to just know what what drives you to keep doing what you're doing like you're obviously very active in in the community of physiotherapy like you really want to make the profession better improve it like what, what is it that deep down like drives you to keep doing that i'm just too stubborn to give up yeah i i i think that's that's my my biggest flaw is that you know i i say once i've got my teeth into something and somebody says i can't do it i'll be like fuck you no way (laughs) so people have turned around say you won't change the physio profession they'll always do what they're always going to do i said no i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do my damned artist to to leave an impression a let not a legacy that sounds right pompous but i'm gonna leave an impression (laughs) right you know uh, when I'm six foot under, that that is it. You know, I'm going to be, you know, and and good or bad, I don't care. You know, if people turn around and say, "Oh, that wanker Adam," you know, look what he did. You know, forty years, fifty years down the line, when I'm retired or six feet under, look what he was trying to do. And I might get it completely wrong. I don't care. But at least people will probably try to remember me for a certain while to say, "Yeah, yeah he did something. He tried to do something." So that that's my drive. I think is that I do I do just want to get physiotherapists a bit more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
not simplistic. They just I just want them to be a bit more commonsensical in their approach yeah. when dealing with things that hurt and 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 just recognise their uncertainty, tolerate the uncertainty, the bed, and just get patience deadlifting more. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if anything, if anything, just get patience deadlifting. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think the reason why we do what we what we're doing is just like there's a lot of we, I just see a lot of potential for for physios. Um, to play like a really big role in helping people um, with pa- with pain with anything like we, we we sit in a really good position and I don't think we realize it and and I I really want to make an impact on helping people but also making people in the profession realize like yo this is a pretty cool job that we have and that we have the potential to to help a lot of people absolutely and and keep that passion going mate because the more people like you and me and everything that do start to do that the the more likely things will change and i agree i don't think there's a time in my career or when looking i look back before i even started a physio in physiotherapy's history that we've been in a position where we are at the sort of we're at the crux time where we could actually start to actually take ownership and become the gatekeepers of musculoskeletal health you know, and, and we, we can start to take it away from the orthopedic surgeons because, again, as much as they like to claim it and think that they are the gold standard of musculoskeletal health, they're not. You know, they, they have an important role. I'm not poo-pooing orthopedic surgeons, but they are considered to be the gold standard gatekeepers of musculoskeletal assessment, triage and, and treatment, and they're not. We are. Uh, but we've got to pull our fucking fingers out. We have got mm-hmm. to We have got to up our game. We've got to recognize and we've got to be better at deciding what does need treatment and what doesn't need treatment because that's the biggest issue I see with physiotherapists. Physiotherapists just like to treat everything. And and they just got to, this is one of the biggest bugbears I have. They just gotta fucking learn that stuff just gets better on its own without our assistance. We've got to be better at understanding who who's going to be doing that and who can be left to be getting on with that whilst we focus on the people that do need our help. Yeah. So until we can be until we can be proved and we can be trusted to do that better, which at the moment we can't. Because a fit, you know a patient goes in with a grade one ankle sprain, they'll be treated for twelve fucking weeks and thirty six sessions and given tape and electroscopy and ice packs and everything. It's just like it's a grade one fucking ankle sprain. You know, at the end of the day, they get better on their own. Just give them some basic advice and let them crack on. Same with back pain. You know, do all your tests, make sure there's nothing sinister in there. Acute episode of first time non specific low back pain. Don't treat. Don't intervene. Assess. Triage. There you go. There's some tools and everything. And people say, oh, the worst thing to be doing. It's not. It's fucking not. Yeah. We've got to be better, better at being proven as we can be trusted to determine who we can see and who we can't see and who we can screen as high risk or low risk. And, and then, again, when it comes to treatment, we've got to work out the high value versus the low value treatments. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, at the moment, we're, just, we're, we're, not, we're not doing that well. And until we do, we won't be given this opportunity again. Yeah, I think it's changing though. Honestly, I think I think there's good things happening, and it, and it starts with these conversations. It starts with uh, the people that are putting themselves out there and, and not afraid to to speak up. And I think I think it is going in the right direction. And I just hope other people, like whoever's doing it, continues to do it, and then other people realize it and start to 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 hammer it home because uh, the opportunity's there. So, yep. As I say, the more that do it, the better. And say, don't don't let the dissenters and don't let the negativity and all that sort of stuff put people off. You know, you'll yeah. get it. You'll get it. If you start questioning and critiquing and challenging things, no matter how politely you do it. And that's the reason I don't do it politely anymore. Because I used to. I used to try and do it politely. But people will still complain. People will still critique. People will still call you names. You know, even though you've gone out of your way to be polite and courteous, they'll still say, oh, you're a fucking idiot. You're a wazook. You know, who do you think you are? And I'm like, well, I'm just trying to say this point of view that's a bit different from yours oh who dare you how the fuck do you think you are and st- so i just i don't bother doing the plight this anymore because it doesn't make a difference with the, the negativity in the critique and the feedback you get so uh, not to say that you have to do that who's doing it mm. but just please again just get more people questioning and challenging and critiquing things uh, and the sooner we do the sooner things will start to change i'm sure of it awesome we appreciate we appreciate what you're doing. Honestly, I think I think there's a lot of other people out there that that are appreciative of what you're doing. So, thanks, man. Just keep hammering. Yeah. Yeah. Now I would imagine I'm too stubborn to give up. I've got say too long in the tooth now. I've got thick skin. You know, I've been called every name underneath the sun. Now I've had a few. Le- <laughs> but I've got got a couple of good solicitors on the side now. We know how to deal with all the legal threats. So I've I've done that a few times now as well. So it's oh, all man. all old hat to me. So I'm a pro at this. So if anybody got any uh, any <laughs> arse, like 
from anybody and they need some assistance with some legal advice, just give, give, give me a shout. I'll <laughs> okay, great. Do you want to let people know where they can find more about you? Uh, yeah. I guess uh, I'm mainly social media, obviously. So I'm across all platforms now, mainly Twitter. So that's where I first started off. So I'm at Adam Meekins on Twitter. I'm on Facebook as well. So you can come find me on there. And I've got uh, a personal profile as well as a business one on the sports physio. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well, but I've only just started on there. I can't get the hang of Instagram. It's not you guys on it quite a lot, don't you? Yeah, I can't we, work it. We, yeah, we, can't we got work. a lot of people on Instagram and we got like 18 followers on Twitter. So <laughs> we're like the complete opposite. <laughs> so yeah I've, I've only been on there probably i don't know probably less than a year but I've, I've been toying around with it it's all right but it's a bit it's a bit too young and hip for me if i'm being honest man yeah. and i'll break <laughs> yeah like me mate i just can't i can't hang it um <laughs> and then obviously i've got my website so that's www.thesports.physio and that's where i tend to rant and rave for most of my blogs and stuff on there awesome we appreciate it thanks for coming on adam thanks thanks for inviting me and keep on doing the good work that you guys are doing as well mate Awesome. All right. We'll talk to you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. That wraps up episode 20 of the PT Coffee Cast with Adam Meekins. We'd like to thank Adam for taking the time and coming on and talking to us. Uh, We know he's a super busy guy. Uh, We really appreciate his content. We've learned a lot from his blog, um, also his Twitter and his Instagram account. Uh, he's putting out great content, guys. So if you aren't following him yet, head over there and follow him. Um, we'll put the links in the show notes. If you guys want to reach out to us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at the MVMT PTs. Um, you can email us, themovementpts at gmail.com. Uh, we want to hear from you guys. We want to connect more to our podcast listeners. We'd really appreciated the uh, support that you guys have given us so far. Um, so we want to hear from you. We want to know what you like. We want to know what you think we could do better. Um, if you guys have a particular topic you want us to talk about uh, or someone that you want us to interview, we want to hear from you guys. So reach out. Send us an email. Send us a DM. Uh, we're always going to respond. We love having conversations with uh, with the people that we have following us. Um, that's the reason why we do this, guys. So please reach out to us. We'd really appreciate it. Um, if you like this episode, head over to iTunes, drop us a review, uh, leave us a rating, um, subscribe, and share it with one other person. We want to spread our message as much as we can. That's all we ask from you guys. We love you guys. Keep supporting us. We appreciate it. Uh, and we'll keep up the good content. So we'll see you guys soon.